Hello, this is Dr. Churchill returning for Astronomy 308 into the Final Frontier. And we are in module two of the space race. And today we're going to actually talk about Project Apollo, the big moment we've all been waiting for. How did we get to the moon? And what were each of those missions like? We're gonna break this up into two lectures. Today is part one. So we're gonna be introducing to you a lot of um, background on how you get to the moon, what the mission profile looks like, how one changes orbits, some of the information that really will help, I think, give you an appreciation for some of the maneuvers that the astronauts had to do and actually, you know, how to get out of Earth orbit, how to dock with the lunar landing module, and then how to uh, get into orbit around the moon, how to undock, how to take the lunar landing module down to the lunar surface, do what they do there, walk around, um, lay out some experiments, plant a flag, um, and then lift off, come home, uh, I should say, dock with the uh, command module in lunar orbit again, and then uh, fire the rockets to come home, and then the splashdown. So there's a lot of anatomy. We're also going to learn a few uh, three letter acronyms um, that uh, are very famous in the moon program. And um, what's nice about those is if you learn them and you ever watch some videos and you hear the flight controllers bantering back and forth in the video, uh, you might actually start to know what some of those little uh, three letter acronyms are. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my slides with you, get you started. Okay. Um, make myself just a little bit larger here. Okay. All right, so let's consider uh, this first page here. As you know, we have gone through Project Mercury where we had six flights and we went through Project Gemini where we went from Gemini 3 through Gemini 12. And um, in, in Mercury, we'll remember that we didn't know how to switch orbits or anything like that. We just went up, went around in orbit and came back down. But in Gemini, we actually learned how to change orbits, how to rendezvous with other craft, uh, how to dock with them, how to fire the rockets with the um, docked, what they call stack together, and, and just really learn a lot of how to, how to fly in space. All the, all the maneuvers, all the flying that, that was required in order to do Apollo. We also uh, got out of the spacecraft and finally, as you saw, uh, with some struggles through several of the Gemini missions, finally Buzz Aldrin on Gemini 12 was capable of doing a, a spacewalk where he was able to do some simple work and understand uh, Newton's third law of motion that for every reaction, there's an opposite and equal reaction so that he didn't touch a screw and, and he turned instead of the screw turning kind of thing. Now, we were just cutting our teeth in space when President Kennedy made an announcement on May 25th, 1961. This is the day of the challenge, the day that he put the challenge before the United States. And he basically, as we're gonna talk about, put a timeline on that. But I just wanna say that when he made that challenge, the only thing that we had done with humans in space was Alan Shepard had gone on a suborbital flight and landed 15 minutes later. And that was the extent of our space flight experience. And he said on May 25th, three weeks after Alan Shepard's flight, we're gonna go to the moon. And we accepted that challenge. And yet I know that you understand that the space race was in an environment of the Cold War in which supremacy was very important for many of the reasons we talked about, which we won't review here. But if you look at the date at which this mission was accomplished, July 20th, 1969, you can see here that it did not take us even 10 years to go from basically putting our toe in, in the shallow end of the pool to actually being able to completely swim in the deep end. And this is tremendous when you think about it because the infrastructure to build these rockets, 
to practice the missions, the computer programming that had to happen on every front. None of that existed. We didn't know how to navigate on the moon. We didn't have pictures of the surface of the moon that were clear enough and high enough resolution that we would know where to land a spacecraft. All of this had to be done. I cannot do the story justice. You could teach it for uh, three courses uh, if you really wanted to cover everything that made Apollo happen. But it was roughly less than 3,000 days, 2,950 2, days before we transformed from literally tossing Alan Shepard up into that capsule, capsule to building a national wild, um, excuse me, a national wide aerospace industrial complex, okay, across the entire nation, okay, imagining and inventing all kinds of new engineering, developing ways to test them, building the equipment to test them, okay, everything built for sailing the ocean of space. So this is a, a tremendous growth that happened on, uh, in the human race in less than 10 years. And you can see how long it took the sea race to develop when we talked about the Portuguese working their way down the coast of Africa, that it took from the, the 1430s to the 1460s, and they still weren't around the, the wide Western peninsula of Africa. It took so long for them to push forward. Anyhow, um, and that's why I bring up the, the Portuguese, because in the 1960s, science had changed so much. We were so far away from the dark ages of the ages of the rings of fire and monsters and these ideas that still permeated the consciousness of the sea captains back in those days. That didn't exist. There was no Cape Bahador, so to speak, which was, you know, as you remember, Cape Fear, that that cape that stuck out uh, from Africa, at which the Portuguese captains were afraid to go past it because they thought there would be no return. There's no such fear anymore in this regard that science, technology, engineering had been embraced to the point where it was believed that these there was nothing for which we could make a solution. Uh, There's a tremendous optimism. This became a collective goal of an entire nation. Okay, the, the momentum of the challenge redefined everybody's goals. It took a while, it didn't just happen overnight. By the time Project Gemini was about halfway through, the American public really started to believe that we could accomplish this goal that President John F. Kennedy had set before us on May 25th of 1961. As you can see, here are some amazing images showing you uh, the, the success of Project Apollo, all right? On the left here, we have the Saturn V launch vehicle. It was a special rocket built by Werner von Braun and his rocket engineers that was designed for one reason, and that was to take people to the moon and bring them home safely. This here is the command module and service module orbiting around the moon. This was taken actually from the astronauts when they were undocked in the lunar landing uh, module. And you can see this here, this gumdrop shaped thing is the space capsule, uh, held three astronauts. This here is the service module. You can see some of the reaction control uh, engines here. You can see the docking here for the lunar landing module. Um, and then you can see the high gain antenna, which points back to earth for communicating. And this engine here is known as the SPS. And this was the main propulsion engine that would get them into lunar orbit and get them out of lunar orbit to take them home. This is an image of uh, an astronaut, I believe it's Al Warden in Apollo 15. And he was the command module pilot. And one of the things that they had was in the service module here, you can see our cameras and as the astronauts that went down to land on the moon went down on the moon, he would use this bay here, this camera bay, he would rotate the spacecraft and point these cameras at the moon and they would take super high resolution photographs of the moon and stereoscopic photographs and infrared spectra and things like that. But he, when they were halfway back between the moon and the earth, okay, so imagine this, you are out in space about a hundred 
thousand miles away from the moon, uh, roughly 150,000 miles away from the earth. They're just two small little orbs in the sky and you climb out of the spacecraft and walk along it and you are in deep space. Only three astronauts got to make this spacewalk where they were in cislunar space like this. I cannot imagine this experience that only three people have had where they are walking in space, but they're not in orbit around a, a, a moon or a planet. Here's an example of the rover. This must have been either Apollo 15 or 16 or 17. I can't tell exactly which from the photograph, but uh, here is the lunar landing module. The astronauts uh, toward the end of Apollo and Apollo 15, 16 and 17, they would live in there for three days. They would get in the rover and drive several miles out in various directions each day, um, obviously planting the flag here and uh, this area below here that's in gold is called the uh, descent module. It also then would serve as a launch platform. And the only part that would launch from the moon would be this top part called the ascent mode and up it would go. And then of course, when everything was said and done, they had thrown away all of the spacecraft except for the command module. And the command module would re-enter the atmosphere at 24,000 miles per hour and uh, have a five mile fireball behind it as its heat shield ablated all that heat. And um, after it descended down into the lower atmosphere, say around 10,000 feet, it would deploy these main parachutes and then gently land on the ocean for splashdown. It was a, it was a great feat to do this. May 25th, 25 days after Alan Shepard's Freedom 7 flight, Kennedy wanted to enter the space race with the Soviet Union in a way that the goal was set so far down that they could finally get ahead of them. As you know, in the early 60s, the Soviets were doing impressive types of um, space flight that always demonstrated they were a step ahead of the Americans. And so Kennedy knew that we could catch up because we had the industrial complex uh, in which to, to build uh, the momentum to, to surpass them. But we needed time to build that, and then we needed the time to push forward. And this was a situation that this is uh, far enough of a goal that we actually can beat them at this goal. We can have the time to surpass them and then race it in front of them. So here are some quotes from him. Now is the time to take longer strides time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways, ways will hold the key to the future on earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or important in the long range exploration of space and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. So one of the things that was a challenge politically for Kennedy and then for, for the Congress uh, and the, the representatives and senators and uh, for NASA itself, the administration was to fund this project and of course the people that needed to be convinced were the lawmakers, which were the senators and the representatives. So the executive branch and the NASA administrator, which was John Webb, they were coming at both ends, trying to demonstrate to them that this was a worthy thing. And of course, the lawmakers and Congress are always worried about how much money is it gonna bring into my state? Are my constituency gonna get jobs? You know, And so there was just politics, okay? but they made it happen. Now, I'm just gonna get a little bit sort of like uh, uh, on, on the high horse here, talk to you about you know, the, the, the romantic aspect of humanity's desire to look what's over the next hill or to achieve the next you know, greatest goal. And we've talked a great deal uh, about humanity exploring and whatnot, and we've, pretty much looked through the lenses of the fact that this was for you know god gold and glory that that humans wanted to go out and exploit their uh environment and and become 
you know, rich and powerful uh, or influence other people to be more like they are, um, in some cases, suppress people through slavery and whatnot. And, and so it wasn't really a pretty picture, but somehow the Apollo program has sort of been transformed back through the lenses of this romanticism of exploration for the sake of exploration. And Kennedy was very smart about this in, in setting that tone as well. And he even said, and these are his quotes, why some say the moon? Why choose that as our goal? And they may ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? And what he means by 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic is back in 1961, uh, it had been 35 years since Charles Lindbergh had loaded up his spirit of St. Louis, uh, basically a flying gas can, and had left uh, the East Coast of the United States and flew to France, single person on a single flight. And there was a $27,000 reward for it. But it was one of those things that would push aviation forward dramatically. And it did, okay. But again, this is one of these things where people would take on challenges from a very romantic standpoint, right? And then you have, you know, George Hillary, who was the first human being, at least in Western society, recorded um, that had climbed Mount Everest. I have no idea what the history is of local peoples there that may not have been written down. But as we know, George Hillary is, is recognized as the first human being to climb Mount Everest. So these are, these are challenges that are set for, for people. And the moon is, you know, let's just face it, it is a beacon in the sky that just cries out for, geez, can we go there, okay? And so Kennedy says, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So he really set the gauntlet and romanticized this situation, but he also understood that this would have a tremendous unifying effect on the United States and push forward it as a technological power. Okay, now that we've talked about, you know, somebody saying, let's go to the moon, and that we actually took it seriously. We, we took it seriously because of the environment that the United States was in, racing against the Soviet Union for truly what is the high ground. Um, we have to figure out how we're gonna get there. How are we gonna get there? And, you know, even before Alan Shepard um, flew, the Space Task Force at Langley, research facility uh, led by Bob Gilruth was already thinking about this kind of thing. And so they came up with a couple ideas. Um, and the, the, the way you get to the moon, it, it has a special name, it's called the mode, the mode to get to the moon. And so what I'm gonna do is tell you about the four possible modes that were thought about. Okay, so once that goal was set, they really had to get serious about finding, you know, what is the mode of getting to the moon? How are we gonna actually do this? What, what are the steps? And the reason that they wanna do this is because everything that's gonna come after that decision is locked in by that decision. If you decide that you're gonna go to the moon by landing one big rocket, uh, take it off and have it land backwards and then take off and come back and land backwards again. Uh, you know, we know that that was difficult to accomplish. Elon Musk finally accomplished uh, part of those goals just in, recently in the last, you know, half of a decade. So that, that would be very difficult. But the thing is, is that the design of the rocket, how much fuel, how much mass, you know, the, uh, the launch pad on the rocket, the, the mechanisms uh, for how you do it, the, the, the training that you give the astronauts, the procedures that they have to go through to carry out the mission, uh, the practicing facilities that they train on have to be designed around that. And then the, the computer programs that are written, every, you know, absolutely everything is, gets set in stone. And once, once you 
once you decide that you're going to go in this direction, you got to pave the road in that direction. There's no real turning back. So it, they really, this was an important decision. That's my bottom line. Okay. So there were four possible modes that were, uh, that people think about. Now, it turns out that at first, only two of these modes were being taken seriously. And the first was direct ascent. And the second was earth orbit rendezvous. So direct ascent is the one I described earlier, where you take your rocket, it's one big behemoth rocket, you launch it off, you go straight to the moon, you go backwards and you land backwards with your big behemoth rocket. And a lot of the science fiction pictures from the 1950s, they show a big tall rocket with a ladder that you have to climb down uh, to get to the surface of the moon. And so this rocket they called the Nova, it was huge, much bigger than the Saturn V that ended up taking them to the moon. And I've got a picture of the Saturn V here in the background that you can see. It's 365 feet tall. And um, this was, again, one of the mode, modes, and it would have required a, a tremendously huge rocket that uh, people saw as an engineering challenge, quite, quite the engineering challenge. Um, the second one was really uh, proposed by Werner von Braun, and his idea was Earth orbit rendezvous. And this is where you launch one rocket up and it contains a lot of the fuel and it contains the lunar landing module and things like this. So there's a lot of weight that's just brought up to orbit. And then you bring up the astronauts and then they transfer all of this stuff over to them and then they go to the moon and then come back. And uh, th th this way you would have to launch two, two equivalents of the Saturn V almost, uh, maybe not quite as big as the Saturn V. And then you would transfer the materials and you go and you land on the moon. And the idea was that, you know, when you got to the moon, you would do direct descent on the moon in the same way um, when we think of the astronauts returning from the moon and Apollo, they did direct ascent, meaning they came from cis lunar space and went straight into the atmosphere and came back down. They did not enter orbit and then go down. Okay. So that would mean that you would have to do direct ascent at the moon. Now, why was direct ascent and earth orbit rendezvous the two favored? Okay, remember at this time, they hadn't either flown Alan Shepard when they started thinking about this or once they'd flown Alan Shepard and Kennedy set down the goal, they had not ever done rendezvous of two spacecraft. They had no clue whether that was gonna be difficult or whether it was gonna be a piece of cake. It turned out the astronauts were so good that they made it a piece of cake, okay? So direct ascent avoided all of that rendezvous and docking stuff. So that was the real advantage of it. The disadvantage, of course, is that it was a huge rocket. The Earth orbit rendezvous, on the other hand, um, the idea there was, well, you can do rendezvous and you can do docking of these spacecraft, but do it in Earth orbit where if something goes wrong, then you can abort and you can come home. You're not you know, at the moon doing something uh, very dangerous and, and crazy. And if you get in trouble, you're stuck there and will die. And so that was the idea with the Earth orbit rendezvous. And even then, uh, rendezvous and docking had to be developed, learned, and tested uh, and practiced. So these were sort of the, the thinking of the time. But it turned out that there was a third mode and this mode actually is the mode that was used. This is called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, or LOR, instead of EOR for Earth Orbit Rendezvous. In this case, you only fly one Saturn V rocket up, okay? And you have uh, the, the lunar landing module and the uh, command module, you dock them, and then you just take them out to the moon. So, okay, you take this little, little, tiny spacecraft, you sort of shuttle out to the moon in the lunar landing module and the command module dock, and then you go into Earth, lunar orbit, and then you undock the lunar landing module and you land with the lunar landing module while the command module continues to orbit. Then the lunar landing module takes off and they grant rendezvous and dock in lunar orbit, therefore lunar orbit rendezvous. And then they discard the lunar landing module fire the rockets on the command module, bring it home, and then eventually shed the service module so that only the little command module itself comes into the atmosphere. 
So it turned out that if you did this, you were really throwing away everything as you go. So you, you go a little further, you throw away the bottom stage, you go up to the earth orbit, you throw away the second stage, you know, then you do your uh, injection to get out to the moon and you throw away that third stage. And, and basically by the time you come home, you got nothing left but the little capsule that the astronauts have to survive in, okay? And it turned out that this was the winner in terms of costs and in terms of um, amount of mass and materials that had to be sent. One of the things about rockets is, you know, you need for every pound of rocket you send up, you need three pounds of liquid fuel. So every time you add weight to the rocket, you're adding a factor of three more in fuel to get that rocket going. All right. So by making the rocket light, and throwing parts away as you go, then it got lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. By the time you were at the moon, you were just in these small little spacecraft and you, you know, you, you didn't need as much fuel to get them to work around as, as opposed to if you had the behemoth, you know, direct ascent Nova. Anyhow, LOR won the day. Um, it turned out that there was a lot of engineering meetings. A lot of people fought very hard between EOR and LOR. And in the end, uh, the engineers just could not deny that LOR was the hands down winner, okay? Now, another thing that people know about, but this was not really considered for the moon is something called lunar surface rendezvous. Now, if you know anything about uh, a fellow named Robert Zubrin and his uh, Mars Society and his Mars missions that he has proposed, his idea is that you send the spacecraft, land on Mars, they then, uh, use the atmosphere to generate fuel that builds up. And um, then you come later and land next to them. And then you, you rendezvous on the ground next to the, uh, the, the spacecraft that had landed there and that are, are de developing fuel. And uh, then you transfer the fuel to your rocket when you wanna go home and off you go. So that, that was the idea of uh, what you call lunar surface rendezvous, but that one wasn't really considered as much. Okay, so LOR is a, is a, is a three-word acronym I'm going to use a lot, LOR, and that means Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, and that's the mode. That's how we got to the moon. Okay, so let's talk about LOR uh, a little bit. The first thing I want to say is, you know, I've been telling you that there are people when they believe in something passionately and go and work for it very hard, they can change the world, they can make things happen. And this gentleman I'm showing here at the chalkboard, his name is John Holbo. All right, now this gentleman was not really in the inner circle of Johnson Space Center and, and uh, Kennedy Space Center, or at the time, Cape Canaveral. He was working sort of in one of the other uh, NASA research centers and he really studied the LOR problem, but he was so convinced that that was the only way we we're gonna to get to the moon, but he was an outsider. And so he would try to go talk to people that were his direct uh, supervisors and he could not get them to take it to the next layer of management in NASA. He hit the road and he went to all the different NASA centers and he gave talks and presentations and he wrote papers and he just pushed and pushed and pushed LOR and nobody was listening. He finally wrote a letter up six layers of management to Robert Siemens, who was really in charge of the entire Apollo thing. And he explained to Siemens, you need to consider LOR if you wanna to get to the moon in 10 years. Well, Siemens handed it down to the next layer and it went down and it went into the group where Werner von Braun and the other engineers and the space task group were talking about the mode and it got introduced that way. And I like that story because I want to tell you that if you want to change the world, you can as one person, but you have to, you have to be bold. Now, it's true that he took a lot of heat for doing that. I mean, his career was almost destroyed because some people, you know, because people are people and they wanted to uh, remove him from the equation and said that he should be fired for having written Robert Siemens and skipping six layers of management. But in the end, John Holbo is kind of a hero. He really got the engineers to consider LOR and that's why we chose LOR and then that's why the moon missions 
are all carried out and designed the way they were. All right, on the left-hand side here, uh, I have two examples of lunar, lunar orbit rendezvous. Okay, now these are, these are kind of complicated. So what I want to say is, look at the arrow here. This is the direction the spacecraft are orbiting around the moon. So this would be in the mission after you've already gotten to the moon with your lunar landing module and your command module docked. Okay, so you're going around this direction. And in this diagram, um, the sun will be in this direction. Okay, and that's important. You can see from the shadow of the moon here that this is the illuminated hemisphere. So the sun's in this direction. And then the earth is here. If you look pointing downward, the earth is down this way. And so from the advantage point of the earth, you're actually seeing something that looks pretty much like this picture here where you see a, a crescent that's in shadow. And the reason that this was a good angle to land on the moon is because from this angle and, and according to the spacecraft, if you land over here near the day night side of the moon, uh, the shadows are much longer along the, the uh, craters. And so with, with the craters being highlighted better, the astronauts would have better vision as to what they could see while they were trying to land. And so that was part of the idea about the sun and earth orientation. Now, everything was planned out you know, to the second in these things. Okay. So here's your, your combined spacecraft orbiting around and you're coming here and then some here in the sun where you can see everything very clearly, the astronauts would undock the lunar landing module from the um, command module. And then um, they would fly together and as they flew together, they would inspect each other. The command module uh, um, pilot would look at the lunar landing module as it rotated, the astronauts in that module, the lunar landing module would rotate it, and he would inspect it visually to make sure everything was good and everything. And then they would then, uh, the lunar landing module then would fire its rockets to separate away from the, the command module. And so they start flying separately from each other. So they're further and further apart. And then when you get here, on this side of it, and you remember the sun's here. So right here, this is called DOI, which is descent orbit insertion. And this means that the lunar landing module will make a, a rocket burn to slow it down. Now you'll notice that the uh, earth is can be seen uh, here, which means they're still in radio contact when they make that rocket firing, okay? They descend then into this lower orbit because they, they fired this uh, rocket. And, and so they go into this orbit here. Now, the reason this is dotted is because they fire their rocket again. But if they, if they didn't fire their rocket again, their orbit would look like this and they would come back up to the DOI point in the orbit again and just keep going around this way. But what happens here is that as they come down to this um, low part of the orbit, they then do something called the Power Descent Initiation, PDI. You don't have to remember all of these three-letter acronyms, but again, if you happen to hear them, you'll, you'll hear them in movies and you'll know, oh, that means that they're going to fire the rocket to go down to the moon. It's PDI. Okay, so you can see this is in the sun, so they can see what they're doing. It's also on the Earth side of the, the moon, so they're in radio contact and then do PDI and they come down and they do the landing. So that's how it works. So now they're on the moon landed and the other astronaut is still orbiting in this orbit around in lunar orbit and uh, is doing some science experiments. Trust me, they're busy every five seconds. Okay, so how about the ascent after the moonwalk? So as you can see, this is the same diagram, the sun this way and the earth this way. And you have the, the Command service module, that's what they call the CSM. This is the, the command module that's tied to the service module, which has all the batteries and everything in it to keep the uh, so command module powered. It's flying in this orbit. And so they have a, a liftoff burn here at number one. And then they come up here and they have what's called a terminal phase initiation burn, which is basically uh, if they had stayed on this orbit, they wouldn't they would have come back down again, but the, they fire again to get them up into this uh, 
um, orbit that is now going to meet. So they have to have the timing exactly right. The, the, the CSM is coming through here and they're coming up here and they time it just right. So they get to the point and then they have what's called terminal braking because they're, they're moving faster than this uh, spacecraft. So they slow down, they get into rendezvous, they do a little burn and then they dock and the astronauts then uh, transfer back into the command module somewhere probably by this point in the orbit. So that's how you actually carry out lunar orbit rendezvous. So if you ever wanted to know, you now know. Um, and uh, that's that. Okay, now I just want to share with you a little bit about orbits because I want to show you how they change orbits. And this is really the only orbital mechanics we, we're going to do in the class. It's just two slides. And it's the only sort of rocket science that we're going to do in the class. I apologize to you that those people that want to learn rocket science, but this was the wrong class for that. Um, let's talk about Earth orbits. Um, they're broken up into about four various orbits, depending on height. We have obviously low Earth orbit, which we call LEO. That's the orbit that the space station's in and things like that. Uh, the, the space shuttle always flew in LEO. Uh, most of the, uh, all the Mercury's and the Gemini's flew in LEO, except that uh, a couple of Gemini's did do a kind of elliptical high uh, stretch to get some altitude. Then we have moderate Earth orbit or MEO, M-E-O, and you, so you can see relative to the Earth's radius uh, how far out that is. It's about a whole additional Earth radius out. And then we have high Earth orbit or HEO, and this is reserved for uh, long elliptical orbits where we want spacecraft to get further away from Earth, have a full view of it, or we want them to get away from radio interference while they're doing their measurements and things like that. And then we have GEO, geosynchronous orbit. And this is a very, very special orbit. It's about 22,000 miles out from the Earth. And it turns out, that if you think of the Earth rotating once every 24 hours, guess what the period of the orbit is for a satellite in GEO? 24 hours. So what happens is if you're a satellite in GEO moving along here, okay, turns out the Earth is rotating and the same point on the Earth is always un directly underneath that satellite. So you're basically, as the Earth is rotating, the satellite is rotating around and is and that's why we have uh like direct tv you have these antennae that can point in one direction and, and they're pointing at a satellite and just sort of like well, why doesn't that satellite ever move relative to the pointing of that antenna because that satellite's in geo and it's locked in there uh very 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 tightly with with the earth's orbit okay so that's great so we have multiple orbits that we've classified and you know, when you get to GEO, if you're going to get a satellite to GEO, how do you get it there? You don't just fly directly out to GEO and insert it and, there, you know, there it is. You actually have to use a series of what are called transfer maneuvers or orbital transfer maneuvers. So I just wanted to share that with you. And one of the reasons I want to share that with you is because, as you can see, for lunar orbit rendezvous, the astronauts did a transfer orbit here. And then while they're on that transfer orbit, they went for power descent. Okay. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about transfer orbits. Okay. So this is called, uh, and, and if you remember right, Mercury space capsules and Vostok space capsules were not capable of doing this, but the Gemini space capsule and the Voskhod space capitals were able to do this kind of thing. Okay. Um, the transfer. Um, is something that you are going to have to expend energy doing. And so one of the things that we want to do in doing orbital transfers is we want to minimize the amount of energy that we are expending. Okay. And the reason is, is that energy uh, to change orbit comes from burning the fuel. So the more that you burn fuel, the more fuel that you have to take with you in order to complete your mission. So you want to plan these maneuvers ahead of time and put them in your fuel budget. So everything is, you know, on paper is budgeted well ahead of time. Okay, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to say, how can we go from a low orb, Earth orbit, okay, to a high Earth orbit, and do it with the minimum amount of burning fuel, okay? This was developed by an engineer by the name of Holman, and it's now called a Holman transfer. And sometimes the orbit that gets you from the one orbit to the other orbit, what we call the transfer orbit, is called the Holman transfer orbit. Okay, so how do you do this? Okay, we're gonna start here in the small orbit, the green orbit, orbiting around this object. And what's gonna happen is that at some point along the orbit, it could be arbitrarily chosen, we'll call this point one here, we are going to fire the rockets to speed ourselves up, okay? So this is called, you know, basically the uh, perigee burn, okay? Perigee, uh, these are two astronomy words. Perigee means that point which is closest to the Earth, and apogee means that point which is farthest from the Earth. So we're gonna talk about perigee and apogee burns. So number one, we are in this very small orbit, and then we're going to do a perigee burn, which is going to speed us up. As it speeds us up, it now means it's going to push us further out. Now, this burn might last only for, say, four or five minutes, okay? You're basically picking up your speed and putting energy into your motion, okay? And then you turn off the engines, and now you're going to be coasting at a much faster speed. Okay, now the gravity is still acting on you. So as you go up, your, your path curves because you're still trying to be pulled back toward the earth, but you're actually coasting during this time while the earth is trying to sort of slow you down. It's kind of like when you throw a ball up, it slows down as it goes up and then it turns back around. That's exactly what's happening to the spacecraft. We've thrown the spacecraft up and now uh, the Earth is trying to slow it down and eventually bring it back down to where it was when we threw it up. Okay, so here we go. We're on our transfer orbit with our higher speed. Okay, and if we didn't do another burn to speed ourselves up again, we would stay and follow this yellow dotted line and just stay in this orbit now. But what we do when we get to the perigee part of this transfer orbit, the one in yellow, we do another burn. Again, this burn might be, say, for about 10 minutes or something like that. And then we shut down the engines and we basically have thrown ourselves faster. So now that we go along this orbit, and again, the Earth is always trying to pull you back down, like the ball that we threw up was getting pulled back down, except that the spacecraft is moving so fast that it's able to avoid actually falling downward and uh, we get into this orbit. So first we have the perigee burn, we're on the transfer orbit. When we get to the apogee of the transfer orbit, we do another burn and then we are in our destination orbit. So this was actually a, a, a spectacularly beautiful solution to the problem. And again, because we're only firing the rocket, say for about four minutes here, or say about 10 minutes here, we actually have minimized the fuel and the energy consumption and therefore have done the minimum energy transfer. And that has now uh, been not named the Hohmann transfer. So there you have it. Now you know something about how they transfer orbits. Okay, so here we go. This is the Saturn V rocket. I just want to now talk about the anatomy of the vehicle that got the astronauts to the moon. It's about 360 feet high. Um, so it can bring about 285 pounds of payload up into Earth orbit, and it can bring up about 100,000 pounds of payload all the way to the moon, all right? So it just depends upon what, if you're gonna use your fuel for. If you, uh, if you just wanna bring things up to Earth orbit, it, it can bring up almost 300,000 pounds. Um, it's broken up into three stages, three main stages. This is stage number one. This is stage number two. And this is stage number three. Now, not to confuse you, but stage number three is actually called the S4B. So um, you'll just have to deal with that. That is a historical fact that this third stage became S4B. Um, so this is the first stage. It has five F1 engines in it. Each one of these is capable of 1.5 million pounds of thrust. So you do the math. That is 7.5 million pounds of thrust. So when that launches off the pad, 
it is being pushed with a force of seven and a half million pounds, okay? Um, the first stage takes you up about 100 miles. So this entire stage is just fuel and pumps and engines. And this, and again, three quarters of the way is the fuel. And this beast here is designed only to get you up to 100 miles, okay? That ride takes about two and a half minutes. But then you still don't have enough speed to get into orbit. So according to Herman Oberth, you're going to do some staging. Remember that? He invented that way back in the 30s. And you're going to discard this first stage, and then you're going to light the engines on the second stage called the S2. It has five J2 engines. Okay, and these engines then ignite and you're able to push yourself almost all the way up to orbit, almost, okay. So this one also is just pure fuel and pumps and engines. And then you get almost up to orbit. And by this time you're say about 10 minutes or nine, nine to 10 minutes into the flight, you jettison the second orbit and now you, you use your S4B rocket to finally push you up to the 17 and a half thousand miles per hour that you're required to get into orbit. And so these two things have fallen back to the earth or burned up in the atmosphere. And all that's in earth orbit before you're gonna go to the moon is this uh, S4B and then the service module and the command module. Hiding in here is the lunar landing module, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, so, the burn to get you into Earth orbit, that last burn that I talked about between 10 and 12 minutes, they call that Earth orbit insertion. So you burn that rocket and it basically finally inserts you into Earth orbit. And then later on, when you want to go to the moon, it's this rocket on the S4B that will then be fired to push you out of Earth orbit into the, the trajectory to go to the moon. That burn, is called TLI for translunar injection. So here's a picture of the Saturn V on the launch pad with the launch tower, okay? And we've talked about the, the first stage, we've talked about the second stage, and then the S4B. So let's talk about what's going on here. What's, what's packed into the top of this S4B and carried into orbit with it? And so here's an expansion of that. And this area right here is holding uh, the lunar landing module all folded up and ready to go. And these uh, shrouds here um, are, are basically covering it and they open up like daisies. But once you go down to cis lunar space, they'll open up like daisies and you'll, you'll turn around and dock with the lunar landing module. I'll show some pictures of that coming up. So here's the lunar landing module and here are those shrouds that will come off later but you can see when it's all packed up what it looks like here. Here's the service module. This has the oxygen tanks, the fuel cells, has reaction control system jets, cont contains the SPS engine, which actually is used for uh, lunar orbit insertion, and then also trans-Earth injection, uh, all kinds of different burns that are necessary. Uh, sitting on top of that is the command module. So this is sometimes called the CM for command module. This is sometimes called the SM for service module. When the two are combined together as one unit, as a stack, it's called the CSM for command service module. So earlier we talked about the CSM a little bit in our LOR slide, but now and again, you might hear somebody talk about the CSM. That means the command module while it's made into the service module. Sitting on top of the command module is this shroud, which covers and protects uh, the command module while it's lifting through the atmosphere. Once they get up to a certain period, which actually is after they burn out the first stage of the, the rocket, then what they do is they fire the second stage and then they jettison this launch escape tower. And that with the jettison of that also goes the boost protective cover. So the astronauts actually don't have much visibility while they're going up into the atmosphere until they jettison the launch escape tower and the protective cover. 
And then that leaves, and then that opens their windows so they can see what's outside the spacecraft as they go up to Earth orbit. And then it turns out that this launch escape tower is designed to carry the command module away from the Saturn V if it was to go south, which is a term for if it was to, you know, kind of threaten to explode or begin to explode, this tower would fire them at high speed of a high rate of acceleration away from the, the, the bad Saturn V boosters. I like to see this little picture down here is a couple people to give you a little bit of the scale of how big this darn thing is. Uh, you know, the engines are taller than humans, for example. It's just, just an amazing engineering device. Okay, so here's the CSM, as you can see, uh, in some type of detail. And here's the lunar landing module in some detail. Yeah, I'm not gonna go through these in detail, uh, you know, point by point about this is the roll engine and this is the pitch engine, all that stuff like that. But I do want to remind you that spacecraft have three axes for which they do things. You, uh, you can pitch forward or you can pitch up. Uh, you can roll around the main axis or you can yaw, which is to say you can go left or right. That's yaw. And so you have reaction control system engines that actually can move the spacecraft in each of these directions around its center of mass along its axes. You have also an antenna, of course, that you have to communicate with Earth. And the service module here, uh, as well as having the main uh, service propulsion engine, uh, also has the oxygen tanks, hydrogen tanks, uh, the circuits and fuel cells that make electricity, and then sometimes a lot of experimental, uh, scientific experimental apparatuses or apparati. Uh, up here is the docking for uh, the lunar landing module, and that docking is here. So they're actually, they climb from here through here into there. So you can see these things are facing each other this way. So the lunar landing module is upside down when it's docked. Um, just to give you an idea how big the people are, there's three people that fit into the CSM, or I should say just the command module here, and then two people that climb into the limb that survive uh, for the going down to the moon and coming back up. The lunar landing module, um, Oh, sorry, I want to continue with the command module. Um, you can see here are the three couches that the astronauts sit in when they launch. There's a lower bay down here where they do their stuff like go to the bathroom and you know do their, their baths, um, some, what do they call that, sponge baths. Um, and there's a little bit of room to actually move around in here and get a little bit of privacy and sleep in different ways, but not very much. I think it's only something like 13 feet across at the base. It's, it's not really that big. Um, okay, then uh, the lunar landing module is broken into two parts. It's broken into what's called the descent stage, and you can see it has its own descent engine here, and then the legs that are used to land on the moon. Um, this leg has the ladder. This is called the porch, and this is the door to get in and out of the lunar landing module. So the astronauts go up and down this way to get onto the lunar surface. As you can see, this is a very small and cramped space here, and the ascent engine is buried right here. Of course, you have the oxygen tanks and the fuel cells and everything that you need buried around. And so when the astronauts are done with their lunar excursion, um, they fire this engine, and it uses the uh, descent stage as basically a platform from which to launch, and up it goes. And then they fly that all the way up to the, um, the command module into the lunar orbit and they dock and they climb back in and mission accomplished, let's go home. So here's some pictures on the inside. Here's the command module, you can see the three couches. The commander of the mission sits in the left couch. The command module pilot sits in the center couch and the lunar excursion module pilot, the LEM pilot, sits in the right couch. And of course, as they lift off, they all have very different um, jobs. Now, later, uh, when the command module pilot has to actually pilot the command module, the commander will sit in the center couch and the uh, command module pilot will sit over here in the main pilot's seat, actually. Here's an example of what it might look like to be in there. This is a uh, uh, Richard Gordon from Apollo 12. And 
he's obviously doing some camera work here. And you can see it's very cramped quarters. So I think uh, in this picture, he's in this little corner over here looking this way. Whoever took his picture sitting in this couch looking that way. And you can see it is pretty cramped in there. Um, you wouldn't want to hit things or, or knock them around, which is why you'll see a lot of these switches have little rings around them so that you can't just accidentally knock them. You have to actually fit your finger between the ring to push the button. Here's what the lunar landing module looks like. And of course you can see here is Buzz Aldrin from Apollo 11. In the background here is the triangular window that you can see out of, okay? And what's interesting here is that there are, there are no seats. You can see from the left side here, they don't sit down. They originally designed the limb to have seats. They realized that's too heavy. We got to throw them away. And the other thing that kept weighing it down was having too large of windows. So they eliminated both problems by eliminating the seats. They said, well, if you stand at the, uh, at the window and put your head close to the window, then you've got a very good field of view. So that's what they did. They made the windows small and allowed the astronauts then to look directly into the uh, windows. Okay, so um, here's what the lunar landing module looked like. Here's a telescope. Here's the computer. Um, there's the computer pad. Here are the, the navigation orientation, what they call the eight balls. So with all of this, they were able then to, to do the various burns and fly down. I just wanna say all of these here are circuit breakers and fuses for all of the different systems that went on. And sometimes turning a system on or off really didn't mean going and turning it off. It meant, you know, disconnecting the, uh, the uh, breaker. Uh, that's how they were able to do that. Okay, so moving right along here, um, let's talk about phase one of the lunar landing uh, land, uh, missions. Um, Phase one is uh, basically testing the Apollo spacecraft, what you call the shakedown. That was uh, Apollo one. It was supposed to fly in February of 1967. This is now known uh, as the fire. When you read um, the book, A Man on the Moon by uh, Andrew Chaikin, uh, one of the chapters is just called The Fire. And it's the story of Apollo one, which was NASA's biggest tragedy up to that Point until the Challenger accident. The uh, individuals were uh, just doing a pad test, checking the pressurization of the spacecraft, and unfortunately a fire broke out and they were trapped in the spacecraft and died. So that is the beginning of Apollo, not an auspicious start. So after some time went and they rebuilt the spacecraft and improved it and made it much more fireproof, for example, then Apollo 7 was the first manned Apollo mission. This is the shakedown flight. This happened in October of, of 1968. And um, it used what's called the new Block 2 spacecraft. The Apollo 1 was the Block 1 spacecraft. This is now the Block 2 Apollo spacecraft. They flew it around the Earth um, and checked out all of the systems, the maneuvering, uh, the life support systems, everything. And, did a full shakedown and it flew beautifully. So they knew that they were in great shape. Now the plan was that they were going to then uh, do more Apollo 7 like missions. They were gonna have Apollo 8 actually uh, take the lunar landing module up and do uh, orbit rendezvous with the lunar landing module in earth orbit in order to test out all the systems for how you would do that at the moon. Now a problem happened in that the um, Norman Rockwell, who was building the lunar landing module, was way behind schedule. And so they were sort of like, uh, what are we going to do? We can't delay it. What are we going to do with the Apollo 8 mission? OK. And then something else happened. It turned out that the Russians were, had their N1 rocket on the stage in uh, October uh, or November of 1968. And um, they were afraid that in early December, that they were going to send an astronaut out to the moon and just you know do a loop-de-loop -loop around the moon and therefore go we got to the moon first and nasa was not going to be beat so they decided you know what we can't take the lunar landing module up and do that earth you know shakedown uh mission let's send the astronauts all the way out to the moon on apollo 8. we then won't have a lunar landing module 
which is a little bit dangerous, but they can you know, go out to the moon, orbit it, and bring them home. And we'll be able to practice all of the deep space stuff that we need to do. How do you navigate to the moon? How do you go into orbit? How do you communicate? How do you re-enter the earth when you're coming back from the moon? They can test all of that. So that's what they decided to do. So Apollo 8 was the first mission to go to the moon, didn't land on it. They orbited 10 times. Now you've probably seen the famous Earthrise photo. That was taken by one of those astronauts. They always argue about who took it. Was it Bill Anders or Jim Lovell or was it Frank Borman? But I really want you to think that these are the three, these are the three human beings, Borman, Lovell, and Anders. We always think about Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins and all this stuff like that. But these were the first people to get in a rocket and go somewhere, not just circle the planet. They had a destination. They were the first human beings to see the Earth in its entire sphericity embedded in the infinity of space. They were the first persons to go out to the moon and orbit and see it close up with the human naked eye and then come home and to, to tell the story. So really, you know, we always say, oh, Christopher Columbus was this great explorer and discoverer. And yes, the discoverer of the new world. Okay, that's how history's written them down. But I guess what I'm trying to say is when you think of Columbus in terms of the sea race, okay, well, you really shouldn't think of Neil Armstrong in terms of the space race. You should think of Borman, Lovell, and Anders. They're the first ones to leave the earth, okay? So let's look at Apollo 1. Okay, in Apollo 1, um, we see that uh, it was Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. Of course, Gus Grissom we know about from Mercury and Gemini. Ed White we know from Gemini, the first spacewalk. Roger Chaffee was in the, uh, the 14 and um, third astronaut class, and he did not fly in uh, Gemini, he was a rookie. So this was gonna be his first mission. Now, as you can see, um, here's a picture of one of the astronauts practicing getting in and out of the spacecraft. Now, one of the things about the Block 1 spacecraft was that the um, hatch actually, this is, this is an erroneous picture because uh, the hatch actually on the Block 1 spacecraft opened uh, inward. Okay, they wanted the pressure inside the spacecraft to hold that hatch against the wall. And so basically you, you would pull the hatch inward. And so um, that turned out to be a fatal design for them because when the fire broke out inside the spacecraft, it created a huge amount of pressure, gas pressure, and pushed that hatch against the wall, of the, the hull of the spacecraft at hundreds of pounds per square inch. And um, so there was no way that any human was going to pull that in and get it out. So even Superman may have had a, a hard time of getting out of that spacecraft. So they literally burned alive. And what happened? What happened was, and you, you'll see that, read this in the book, is that well, they were doing a pressure test. And when you do a pressure test, um, you, you, you raise the pressure up of the gas inside the spacecraft to be much higher than the surrounding atmospheric pressure. Atmosphere pressures are on 14.7 PSI, pounds per square inch, and they pressurize that spacecraft to 16 pounds per square inch. Now, here's the problem. They did it with pure oxygen. Now, pure oxygen at 16 PSI is, if you light a match under those conditions, they said even aluminum will burn. And so there was a spark in one of the electrical systems It ignited and just bam, with 16 PSI pure oxygen, that fire just went off the charts. They had no prayer getting out alive. And so here's the Time Magazine showing them before they're gonna fly. And then here, of course, is the coda to their mission, Virgil Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee um, buried at Arlington uh, National Cemetery. At least I know Virgil Grissom and Roger Chaffee are, but I think that Ed White might've been buried in the Air Force uh, version of Arlington. I'm not sure about that. 
Um, here's a picture of the three astronauts while they were actually at the um, Norman Rockwell, the builder of the spacecraft. And there were so many problems with this spacecraft while they were testing it and trying to work it out that they actually made this photograph as a joke and gave it to the CEO of Norman, uh, North American. Did I say Norman Rockwell? I meant North American. And signed it. So there's a signed version and framed version that was given as a gift before the mission. And it's a, it's a sad irony that um, their faith was not withheld, not, not, did not hold out. Okay, the Apollo 7 shakedown, you know, I can't do these missions justice in one word. So you're gonna be watching some videos about these, I mean, in one slide. This was Wally Shara, you knew him from uh, Gemini, uh, from Mercury and Sigma 7. And then you uh, knew him from um, Gemini. He flew Gemini 6, did the first rendezvous with Gemini 7. And then Walt Cunningham and Don Isley, those were also, uh, Actually, they were in the, the third and fourth class of astronauts. Uh, sorry, the third class of astronauts. And they were also both rookies. So they flew with Wally Shara and Apollo 7. This was the actual first manned flight of the Apollo program. You can see that it didn't launch on the Saturn V rocket that I just told you all the details about, but it actually flew uh, on what's called the Saturn 1B, which is a smaller version of that booster. And um, so anyway, they flew in Earth orbit and uh, did what's called the shakedown of the Block II uh, command module. They also uh, did rendezvous and somewhat uh, almost docked with the top of the S-4B, which was acting as a sort of makeshift uh, lunar landing module in order for them to do some practicing. Of course, they didn't have a real lunar landing module, but they had basically this target which would help them center themselves and pretend to be docking because that would be something they would be practicing in later missions. Now, uh, it turned out that they all got colds and when they got colds, they became really cranky. And so it turned out that, that Wally Shara in particular is the commander set the tone and he was not interested in doing these TV shows that NASA wanted to do or doing these little like science experiments that they added to the flight plan. And he became very cranky and of course, uh, Cunningham and Isley had to follow his lead. They had the first sort of mutiny in space where the flight director on the ground would, would tell them, you know, do this or do that. And they would say, no, we're not going to do it. And the, the final thing that was the final argument that they had the problem with was NASA's protocol for the mission was when you come and re-enter into the atmosphere, you put the helmet on. And Wally and, and uh, Cunningham and Isley said, no, we're not gonna wear the helmets. And they didn't wear the helmets. Well, this was considered a direct disobedience by astronauts from the flight ground control crew. And uh, that forced them to make a decision. You know, who's in charge, the astronauts or the ground control? And it turned out that of course the astronauts are always gonna do what they think they need to do to save their lives, to carry out the mission. But in the end, the authority officially was given to the ground control. That if we give you an order, you follow it, okay? But this wasn't the military. And these are military pilots. So they probably felt that we're the commander of the ship and we get to, so there was uh, some tension there. Bottom line, these three astronauts never flew in space again. They were sort of quietly let go. Okay, Apollo 8. Now, Apollo 8 was that fantastic first mission to the moon. I told you why it happened, the two reasons why. One was that they didn't have the lunar landing module. They were supposed to you know, do a shakedown in Earth orbit with it. And the second was that the Russians seemed to be threatening to fly to the moon themselves. OK, so um, this was one of the best pictures in the world, in my opinion. I was six years old. And when this flew, yeah, six years old. And uh, I, I wrote NASA for pictures, uh, eight by 10 glossies of all these space flight pictures. And it was fantastic. I got a whole book of them. And one of the pictures that I had was an eight by 10 glossy of the liftoff of Apollo 8, which just has left a mark in my mind my entire life as a, a great morning of 
you know, of a liftoff and the first flight to the moon. It was so exciting as, as a young child growing up. Here's the Earthrise picture when they successfully got into lunar orbit. Here's a nice artist rendition of their doing what's called the, the trans lunar, trans Earth injection burn. They're in orbit, and this is their firing the rocket to speed themselves up in order to come back to Earth and escape the moon's gravity. Here's a picture of the three astronauts. This is Frank Borman. He was the commander. The command module pilot was Jim Lovell, and then the lunar landing module pilot was Bill Anders. Now, poor Bill Anders. Bill Anders was supposed to be involved in the first shakedown mission of the lunar landing module in Earth orbit. That would mean that he would be the first astronaut in the astronaut corps to actually have flown a lunar landing module, which would make him the most experienced astronaut in the entire crew. That would put him as an obvious candidate for being the one to land on the moon and walk on the moon for the first landing mission. But that didn't happen because he went to the moon basically as a passenger. He had some duties, but literally he lost all of his duties because there was no lunar landing module on this mission. And so he basically was 80% passenger and really gained no additional flight experience with the lunar landing module. It basically washed him out of the running and he never flew again for NASA um, in the Apollo program. Um, Jim Lovell, you knew from, from uh, Gemini and also uh, Borman. They flew together in Gemini 7, 14 days in space. So those two people, they knew each other very well, 14 year, days of a space experience together. Good crew to send out to the moon together, you know, very experienced um, and experienced working together. Here's a picture of the uh, command module re-entering the atmosphere and you can see that it's just got this huge flame coming behind it and temperatures as hot as the sun uh, around the spacecraft. Here's the patch basically showing the earth, the moon and the figure eight. Now, now literally this is a little bit misleading because they actually uh, orbited the moon 10 times before they came home. Now, one of the notable things about this was that um, they, on Christmas Eve, they actually flew in late December of 1968. And on Christmas Eve, they did a radio show to the Earth and uh, they decided to read out of the book of Genesis, for which some people were upset about and other people were just ecstatic about. And it's kind of a very moving uh, radio broadcast. And someday, uh, if you see that on a movie or, or listen to it on YouTube, it's really uh, uh, one of those moments in history where you started to feel that humanity is really something special and humanity is going to do some special things. It was a very optimistic moment. And I should add that 1968 otherwise was a horrific year. Okay, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. There were huge civil rights uh, movements with all kinds of um, fighting in the street going on. Uh, so it was, it was that, that year was absolutely horrific. The other things happened too, but I'll spare you the details. Okay, um, this was part of the press release package for the Apollo 8. So if you were working for the press and you wanted to know all the details and how do you explain it to the American people, this was one of the diagrams you got. And as you can see, it's pretty complicated and not easy to parse. So I would imagine that NASA really felt that uh, people were a lot smarter than uh, the kinds of things that get publicized today. This is very, very elaborate diagram where you have to sort of think of things at different times. And the idea is this is the path of the moon that's happening with time. And uh, this is where the moon is located at launch. And then it has moved over here so the spacecraft has to actually shoot for a position over here to meet the moon, because when it launched, the moon was over here. Then and the moon's moving around the Earth as you uh, do your 10 orbits. And then, of course, by the time you decide to um, leave, it's over here, and you do your trans-Earth injection burn, and you come home, and the moon just keeps going on its merry way, but then you come home. So the moon has really gone <laughs> through about a third of its orbit during a lunar mission, if you think about that, uh, it's pretty amazing. Okay, I'm not gonna get into this diagram in more detail, but you're welcome to, to look at it. All right, 
Now, um, this is called the, you know, the, the book of TLA, um, the three letter acronyms that we've been talking about. So I've mentioned several of these already, but I just wanna mention these so that you can go back and look at them uh, while we're talking about uh, part two of this um, um, uh, video. Okay. I'm trying to figure out where I put my thing. Okay. Um, so this is where I want to say my uh, attendance word, and that's going to be that the space capsule payload contains 16 pounds per square inch of pure oxygen, 16 PSI of pure oxygen. Okay. Uh, so with the three letter acronyms, um, there are some that you're going to talk about. We've already done the astronaut positions, the commander, CMD, left seat, commander module pilot, CMP, and the lunar module pilot, LMP. Okay, we've talked about the spacecraft. I've already told you about the command module, the service module, the stack of the two of them docked together called the CSM, command service module, then the lunar module, the LM, and then the service propulsion system engine, the big engine on the back of the service module called SPS engine. Um, now, when it comes to communications, you'll hear people say AOS and LOS, and OS means of signal, in other words, radio contact. AOS means we have acquisition of signal. So if you came around the far side of the moon and now you have a direct line of sight to the earth, then your antenna now can start to pick up the signal from the earth, and so we call that acquisition of signal. And then uh, when you go around the far side of the moon, as you go to the point where the earth has gone past the the uh, horizon, and now you can't see the Earth anymore from the point of view of the spacecraft, they call that loss of signal. Another time loss of signal happens is during spacecraft reading through the atmosphere, where the uh, fireball and the ion plasma around the spacecraft blocks the radio signals. And then as it gets lower in the atmosphere and that plasma goes away, and then you get acquisition of signal again. Now, we've talked about some of the uh, burns or the rocket maneuvers. Um, We've talked about Earth orbit insertion, EOI. Uh, that's the, the burn of the S4B at the very end. We've talked about lunar orbit insertion. Uh, we're gonna show when that happens, but this is a, a burn where you slow yourself down to get captured by the gravity of the moon. PDI, the power descent assertion, insertion. We said that's where the limb actually does the transfer orbit to, do, uh, to go down into the uh, power descent mode. Something we haven't talked about is PTC. Um, that's called passive thermal control. It's nicknamed barbecue mode. Basically, as the spacecraft is floating between the Earth and the moon in cislunar space, they rotate it around its long axis. And that way, as the sun is beating on it, it keeps uh, turning the, the side that's under the sun away from it and round and round and round like a rotisserie. So they call it barbecue mode. And basically uh, it's called passive thermal control because it's just sort of a passive spin. And then the sun is heating the spacecraft uniformly you know, as it rotates, PTC. TEI is the trans-Earth injection. That is the, the burn that you do after you've entered Earth orbit uh, before you're going to the moon. And then you check out your spacecraft in orbit and then you, you um, Whoops, I got it wrong. I was explaining TLI. Okay, so let me go back. TLI is translunar injection. That's after you've gotten into orbit the first time. You check out all your systems in Earth orbit and you say, okay, everything's good. We're going to go to the moon, burn the back, that engine back there in the S4B for about 10 minutes and push us up to the speed that takes us out of Earth orbit and sends us on our way to the moon. Translunar injection. TEI is exactly the same, except it happens at the moon. After the astronauts come back from the spacewalk and they dock with the lunar landing module and the CSM, okay, they throw away the lunar landing module and then they do what's called the TEI burn, which basically speeds them up so that they can escape the moon's gravity and sends them on a trajectory toward Earth. That's the happy moment, we're coming home. Okay. All right, we're getting a little long in this lecture and I still have about three slides to go. So please bear with me, I apologize. 
The anatomy of the Apollo mission uh, is in this order. First, you launch into Earth orbit. Then you have to leave the Earth for the moon. This is your translunar injection burn. Then what you're going to do is you have to extract the lunar landing module from the S4B stage, because remember, it's hiding in there under those shrouds. And after you do dock it, then the two are docked together like this, as you can see. And this is actually what ends up flying to the moon, is this little stack, all right? Um, then you coast to the moon and you in, insert yourself into PTC, passive thermal control, so you're barbecuing your way to the moon. And then you get into lunar orbit, you have to then do lunar orbit insertion, and that's where you use the SPS engine then, fire yourself backwards to slow yourself down and get captured by the moon's gravity. Then we do our lunar, lunar orbit rendezvous. We undock the lunar module uh, and do the landing on the moon. Uh, we lift off from the moon and then redock with the command module. And then we jettison the lunar module. A lot of times we actually let it crash into the moon so that we can measure the seismic impact and get some science out of that. So on the moon are six limbs that are all tangled up and crashed up, made a crater. So someday, someday can go salvage all that, sell it on eBay. Um, and now we want to leave the moon. So we're in orbit uh, in the command module, service module. We burn the SPS engine to do the TEI, the trans-Earth injection, that allows us to escape the gravity of the moon. Then we're coasting back to the Earth. Again, we go into barbecue mode, so we barbecue ourselves on the way home. And then as we approach the Earth, uh, this, this is gone now. So now we're just, this is what's been coasting back to the Earth. We have to get rid of the service module and the SPS engine because the only thing that's coming home is the command module. So we jettison the service module here and it basically separates from the command module and then burns up in the atmosphere as it re-enters Earth. It's coming in at like 30, 24,000 miles per hour or so. Um, so that happens as you approach the Earth and you're coming in fast, so you gotta do that right. Uh, you then re-enter the atmosphere, uh, you get loss of signal, and then you get down to the lower atmosphere, you, you let out the parachutes, you get acquisition of signal, and then you have splashdown and you're home. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the anatomy of a lunar mission. So a lot of people don't know that information. They know we went to the moon and they see pictures of this, but really those are the 13 big steps. Okay, um, so it takes three days when you shoot to the moon. And um, what I said was that you have to shoot for where the moon's going to be. So this is my diagram similar to the press release um, showing you in Earth orbit. And by the time you're doing uh, the, the launch and TLI burn, which they're, they're usually only about uh, three or four hours apart from each other, the, you know, the moon is over here, but it's moving at around 5,000 miles per hour. You have to transverse 248,000 miles of cislunar space. OK, when you do the TLI burn, if you speed up over here and it pushes you out and again, you're only doing it for about 10 minutes and then the, the, you've, you've given yourself the velocity or thrown yourself out into this trajectory. The TLI burn is again with the S4B engine with the limb still inside uh, impacted here and here's the CSM up front. So this is the TLI burn configuration that, and this is what actually starts on its way away from the earth. Eventually then we're going to throw away the S4B and dock with the LEN. Now, when we're in lunar orbit, after we've done our mission, okay, uh, we have to do what's called lunar, lunar orbit uh, burn. And so as we're coming in, we're coming in, I think it's something like 8,000 miles an hour, I'm not sure exactly these numbers, but I'm in the right ballpark. And the moon's moving at something like 5,000 miles an hour. So you're really threading a needle coming in here. And then you, you put yourself uh, backside front and you burn backwards to slow yourself down. It's called the LOI burn. And it slows you down to the point where you get captured by the moon's gravity and you enter lunar orbit. Okay, the LOI burn. Okay. Now, uh, this is a little bit busy, but Here's the S4B with the lunar landing module uh, still inside it, the shrouds and the command module service module. So what happens is that we want eventually for the shrouds to open up to expose the docking ring for the lunar landing module. This is what it looks like before that happens. So after we've done the TLI burn and we're 
we're on our way and we now can see the earth as a whole earth and we're on our way to the moon. It's still 200 and something thousand miles away. You push a button, which explodes some jettison uh, little pyros that then open up these shrouds and allow this spacecraft to go freely. They then use the little reaction control uh, engines to flip it around, uh, yaw, yaw the spacecraft, and then eventually then translate into uh, the docking ring and then translate back out with the rockets firing uh, to push the whole stack out. So they go in, dock, and then they pull the thing out with them. So here's an example of that where the command lunar non landing module has been docked with the command module. And then the, these rockets here uh, are what push the, the whole stack and pull it out. And then you can see here this nice diagram showing you the descent stage, the ascent stage, the docking area, the docking tunnel, the command module, and the service module. So this is, happens after TLI. And then after you have separated from the S4B here, this is uh, the stack. This is what goes to the moon. This is what goes into lunar orbit. Okay. And this here is an S4B. It just ends up floating on its way toward the moon. They then use some little reaction control rockets to actually make it get further away and get on a trajectory that will allow it to crash into the moon. And again, they measure the seismic impact of that and, um, and do some science with that impact. Okay, that are, is my slides for today. I know that I went a little bit over the hour and 15 minutes, but I really appreciate if you made it all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed the fact that today I was able to share with you how an Apollo mission actually works. I hope that you will actually pretty very much sit down and enjoy reading A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin, and because you really, he just does such a spectacular job with that book that you feel that you're actually on the spacecraft, uh, on the mission yourself, and you learn a lot about the astronauts, what they felt, how they experienced it, some of the problems they faced, how they surmounted those problems. And um, for example, there's the whole story about how Frank Borman got sick and threw up on Jim Lovell, and uh, you know, just amazing stories about what it was like to be there. Okay, uh, when we come back uh, for part two of Apollo, I'm gonna cover from um, Apollo 9 all the way through Apollo 17. So we're actually gonna be focusing more on the missions and discussing them and talking about some of the science they did and the accomplishments they made. So I hope that you will uh, enjoy the second half of the Apollo program as well. And in the meantime, I will say adieu and see you next time.